thanks for coming out on this snowy night when you could be skiing in fresh powder. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for having me and for that generous introduction and for the sponsorship of the donor and for all the members of the history department and the philosophy department who've, who've brought me here. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to talk tonight about uh, the Chernobyl accident and how we frame it and, and how while I was researching this story over about four years, I came to think about how we do history in a different way. Um, a little bit about the accident, it occurred April 26, 1986, reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukrainian Republic of the Soviet Union exploded and then it exploded again. Uh, the accident released, released 20 to 50 million curies of radioactive uh, contaminants into the atmosphere. That is an awful lot of destructive energy. Uh, within 36 hours, Soviet officials drew a circle on the map and they isolated uh, a, first a 10 kilometer sphere around the plant and then later a 30 kilometer and they called it the Chernobyl zone of alienation and removed about 120,000 people who lived in that territory. Um, and you hear a lot about the accident, especially recently the HBO featured a big world, the, so far the world's most watched television show um, about the Chernobyl accident and you hear a lot of dramatic stories and so um, when I started researching this, this history, I was surprised to find out that we know very little for certain about the consequences of the accident. There's a great deal of debate. Um, so I tried to figure out what I can about it. And, and at first I did what historians do. I, I went to the archives. And I, I walked into the archives first in Kiev. And uh, I asked the archivist, I said, you know, do you, I'd like the files on the, the medical files, the Ministry of Health on the Chernobyl accident. And they laughed at me. I said, what are you talking about? This was a banned topic during the Soviet Union. You're not going to find anything. But, you know, I had worked in this archive before, and I knew these ladies didn't like to get off their stools. <laughs> so I said, well, let's just take a look. You know, you never know what you'll find. And within, it didn't take a great sleuth. Within about three minutes, we found a whole document collections, big, you know, bound volumes labeled very clearly the medical consequences of the Chernobyl <laughs> catastrophe. <laughs> So the, these volumes were piled up in front of me, and as I looked at them, I realized I was going to be at this job for years. There was so much. I had found a Klondike of records. The reason the archivists told me that they didn't exist is not because they were trying to deceive me, but because nobody had ever asked for these records before. And that's how archivists work. If they, you know, they don't pull the files, they don't exist for them. So, so strangely, I was the first person to have this question, to go to the archives and ask this question. Um, the, Documents um, tell some pretty surprising stories um, that sort of call into question first the, the Moscow narrative and then the, international, the, the narrative of international experts of the story. The first um, story is that Moscow leaders said that, you know, that they had created this, this zone and the, and the radiation was, was safely contained inside the zone. And they set up you know, guard posts and things like that to protect it. Um, <clears throat> But a few days after the accident, a big storm front was brewing, a big you know, thunderstorm was brewing. It was heading to the northeast from the Chernobyl zone. And along the path were all these big Russian cities, Voronezh, Yaroslavl, and Moscow. And so in a triage operation, they sent up pilots to manipulate the weather, and they seeded the clouds to make it rain on rural Belarus in order to save urban Russia. Now, and you can see that in this map. There's the Chernobyl plant is down there. There was a big city, Gomel, in between. The pilots held off, and they let it rain in that part of Belarus. Now, this was probably, in terms of triage, not a bad thing to do. 200,000 people lived there, farmers, as opposed to millions of people who lived in those big cities. The only problem was... They didn't tell anyone in Belarus they had done this, not even the leader of the Belarusian Communist Party. So these people lived here in this area with terrifically hot levels of radioactivity for until 1999, and then it was finally depopulated. 
So when you hear about tourists going to the Chernobyl zone, they're always going down there. But there are very few journalists and very few disaster tourists who go to the second depopulated Chernobyl zone that's pretty much off the radar in terms of the public, but a, a hu whole huge swath. And so, uh, you know, some of these stories I'm going to tell today have to do with that territory that was fully populated for a good 15 years after the accident. Um, the, um, another narrative, Soviet officials said that they tested the food and they found it safe, safe to eat, go right ahead. Um, working through the Ministry of Agriculture records, I found vectors of contaminated food spreading especially in places where humans congregated. Because humans are, are greedy, and so we take all the food we want to eat and we bring it to places where we live. Um, animals grazing in the fields under those radioactive clouds started to lose hair, get sick, um, and, and weak right after the accident. So they took 100,000 uh, animals and killed them. And then, you know, it was the Soviet Union, it was a poor country, and they hated to waste all that meat. <clears throat> so they, they, they wrote a, I call this a manual for survival because I find all these instruction manuals in the archives. So they wrote an instruction manual for meat packers. Okay, you've got all this radioactive meat. Um, what you should do is grade it high level, high, medium, and low levels of meat. And the, the low and the medium levels of meat, take that meat, mix it with clean meat, and make sausage and send that meat all over the Soviet Union, label it as you normally would, but just don't send it to Moscow. <laughs> the people who wrote the manual, they lived in Moscow. Um, the high level meat, put the high level meat in freezers and wait till it decays and then we'll use it later. So pretty soon the meat packing plant in Gomel, they're writing to say, we need more freezers. They keep writing the same letter, we need more freezers. They don't, I, I, pr I presume they don't get any freezers because they keep asking for freezers. Or maybe they just get more freezers but they have that much meat. So thinking creatively, they found a refrigerated train car and they stuffed 60 tons of radioactive meat in this train car and they sent it to Baku. In Baku, the Geiger counters went off at the train station and, and they sent the meat on to Yerevan in Armenia. And then they sent it out, you know. And so this ghost train circulated the Soviet Union for four years filled with radioactive meat. <laughs> Finally, in 1990, the KGB buried that meat where it should have been buried in the first place in the Chernobyl zone as radioactive waste. Um, as I worked through the Ministry of Agriculture records, I found that almost all agricultural food products were contaminated with radioactivity. And so Soviet officials started, um, they get requests, like, well, you know, can we eat this bread? Can we eat this butter? This is butter. Um, and so they came up with permissible levels. They sort of guessed, you know, how radioactive can your honey be? How radioactive can your tea be? That kind of thing. They didn't really know the answers, but they made up these answers as they went along. <clears throat> And what you find is that in places like that Mogilev, um, you know, second Chernobyl zone that I was just talking about, three quarters of all milk was over permissible levels in 1986, just as radioactive in 1987 and 1988. 22% uh, of all mother's milk was over permissible levels. Imagine trying to come up with a permissible level of radioactivity for mother's milk. Um, so the food is moving around, this, this landscape, and, and other agricultural products as well. And so I started to see patterns of um, contamination that just didn't make sense. And is there a pointer here? I don't think there's a pointer. Um, in areas where that were not very radioactive, I've, I found that the people were coming up um, with a status of liquidators. And I found specifically in this town of Chernigov, and you can see there, it's outside of the high levels of radioactivity, I found that there were 200 wool workers who were given status as liquidators. Now liquidators were people who got special subsidies and medical monitoring because they had helped out liquidating the accident. And so I was like, that's funny. What, you know, what would female textile workers be doing to get that kind of dose to be qualified as liquidators? So I looked around more in the archives and finally I got, I got in a rental car and I drove up to Chernigov and I had this list of these 200 women, and I find 10 of them 
still at their posts. Their job is to sort and then clean dirty wool that comes up from the fields. And um, I showed them this you know, list. And um, well, first I went to the management. And the management said, yeah, we had a problem with radioactivity in 1986. And we called in, commission came from Moscow, and we changed our process, and the problem was solved. You know, it's no problem. But when I went to talk to the women, um, they were like, yeah, yeah, there's my name on the list, and there's my name. And, and I said, well, where's everybody else? And they said, oh, they've all either died or they've been invalided out on pensions. Um, and I, you know, so, you know, what happened? How did this happen? And it turns out, and I, and I verified this in the archives, that every time they picked up a bale of wool, and they had to do that many times a day, it was, the, the, the wool measured 3.2 micro rodent an hour. Um, and that's like picking up a, an x-ray machine while it's turned on. That's how radioactive it is. Um, and the women, um, knew a great deal more than the management about this event. You know, they, they pointed to different parts of their body that were diseased or ached, and they knew which radioactive isotopes of the many that came out of the, from the fallout of the accident, went to which parts of their body. They had a very good understanding of, of, of radio, of health physics for the most part. Um, they also knew, they said, you know, what do you think happened to the, you know, we got this wool pretty clean, but what do you think happened to the wastewater that came out of the plant? That was, of course, radioactive. Um, I said, yeah, what did happen to it? And they said, well, it went into the municipal drinking water reservoir. I didn't believe that, but again, I looked it up, and sure enough, in the archives, they, these women were right. Um, so I could tell from from the archival record that these women knew a lot more than the managers, or that at least what the managers were willing to concede to me. Now, the other story that the Soviets told is that they um, gave medical exams to 900,000 people after the accident, and they saw no change in health statistics. Um, they also, Moscow said that they had three, 300 people who were hospitalized because of the accident, and these were mostly firemen, and nuclear plant operators. Um, and and you, if you watched the HBO special, you saw a lot about that. What I found in the archives is not 300 people hospitalized. That was just the count from one hospital in Moscow. But if you counted all the hospitals that took Chernobyl patients, 40,000 people were hospitalized in the summer after the accident, 11,000 of them children. Records show that immediately after the accident, doctors treated sick kids and adults uh, they recorded an increase in thyroid problems, complications at birth, birth defects, and infant mortality. Children and pregnant women that first summer were especially hard hit. Um, but in 1987 and 1988 and 89, the problems persisted. In 1987, in contaminated regions, half of the children had enlarged thyroids. Uh, perinatal deaths doubled in 1987, that's children who die within 28 days of birth, and they tripled in 1988. Um, in one county, for instance, of 103 pregnancies, and, and this is a pretty typical number, 63 of these pregnancies amounted to a viable baby. The rest died mostly of birth defects. Among adults, um, cases of heart disease, enlarged thyroids, gastrointestinal, urinary tract <laughs> disorders, cataracts, liver, blood diseases doubled and or tripled between 1984 and 1988. Cancer rates climbed from 1986 to 1989, five times higher per capita, again in that area, that second Chernobyl zone, than in the rest of Belarus. Um, and here's, here's a couple of uh, a young, an older man and a, a boy, both with thyroid cancer. And you can see with this boy, the, the larger head and the smaller body, that before the, the thyroid problems created all these problems with growth and development. Um, but these are the kind of uh, charts that come out of the archive. Um, this one says of 1,551 children that we looked at in this one county, 1,132 had one chronic disease or another. And, and this is what you find before um, the Soviets, you know, they had a, a socialized medical system, so they did this sort of normalized epidemiology all the time. That, you know, local public health officials had to send in charts. And normally they had this category healthy. And normally before 86 in these region, regions, 90 to 80% of the children would be categorized as healthy with 
basically no health problems. And 10 to 20% would have something. This flips after 1986. So you see here where like 80% of the kids have something. Um, the categories are, you know, have a lot to do with endocrine system, respiratory system, um, circulation, and, um, and then birth defects. Here's another one from Belarus. This is the um, kids, in a, again, in a, one county that had um, a pernicious anemia. Uh, numbers go up, you know, or 30 percent of the population of the childhood population would have these problems with anemia. Um, the simple questions of fatalities is hard to answer. Uh, UN websites give the number. If you check today, you'll get this number: between 33 and 54 people died from the Chernobyl accident. Um, the Chernobyl Forum report. Uh, projects 4,000 to 9,000 eventual cancer deaths over time from Chernobyl. Greenpeace gives a number of 90,000 eventual deaths from Chernobyl. Um, the lower numbers are most often cited in the New York Times, Washington Post. So 50, I was like, 54 people, you know, is that real? I mean, really? 54 people. Um, in Ukraine alone, 35,000 women get compensation for their spouses having died from a Chernobyl-related accident, a um, health problem. Now that's just, that's a very limited number. That, that only accounts men who were old enough to marry um, and who were married. So that's a, that 35,000 is a, is a low end. Chernobyl um, radi radiation mostly went to Western Russia and Belarus. Ukraine, even though it occurred in Ukraine, Ukraine only got about 30% of that fallout. Belarus and Western Russia have not been brave enough to make a count, and at least to publicize it officially. So, so we don't know. So the minimum number is 35,000 dead. Off the record, Ukrainian officials say 150,000 die, they think, so far already from Chernobyl. So we have this big range, 35, 150,000. I was really working to sort out this confusing record. Who was right? Was there really a public health disaster on this scale that we just overlooked? Four million people were exposed to Chernobyl radioactivity. Can this be right? Um, how does the story of that dimension slip beneath the radar if, if there really was a public health disaster? <laughs> Now, the textual records reveal many contradictions, as I've pointed out, and, and conflicting measurements, plus some strange occurrences. In 1990, as this public health disaster story was starting to break in the press and, and go abroad, um, four hard drives in the Soviet Union and medical institutes that had this valuable data of, of dose estimates that they had made of individuals, they recorded from people who had been exposed. These hard drives were, went missing, and the floppy disks also went missing from four different, I mean, one summer of 1990. So something was up, and we've, they've never been recovered. So we don't really know what the, how much, what kind of radioactivity the people were exposed to. Um, I found in the archives that Soviet officials falsified accounts while KGB agents planted fake stories in the newspaper. Um, I also noticed that consultants for UN agencies who came in in 1990 to make an independent assessment of the problems disappeared evidence um, and dismissed about half of the research they got from these local Soviet researchers who were on the ground. Um, thinking of WikiLeaks and the 2016 elections, I, and this is when, you know, the context in which I was researching this, I grasped that information from archives and reports could have been planted in the archives for me to find later. Like, you know, how do I know? Um, it was clear that people were lying in this story. It was clear that the archives were lying. Um, so how could I fact check this story? And then I thought, maybe I, somehow I could locate more reliable sources. And I really thought over this for a long time. How, you know, how do I find more reliable sources? You know, people lie, archives lie. But maybe I thought, trees don't lie. So I went to get another kind of education to figure out if I could learn something about the local ecology of this region to try to see if I could get a, sort of a material archive to figure out what happened. Now, one thing to know about the Chernobyl region is that it took place, the, the, the plant was built in Europe's largest swamp, which is called the Pripyat Marshes. And this swamp is absolutely gorgeous and amazing. It, seven, it's a, it's a 
bowl of, of land, a vast bowl of land, where it's intersected by 17 rivers and hundreds of streams and ponds and lakes and a lot of boggy areas. And in the um, flood season, whole areas of this place have traditionally been sort of, you know, would just be flooded out for several months and inaccessible for several months out of the year. Um, now, reactors need a lot of water and they, they're, better, they're best put in places with sparse population. So the swamp was chosen as a place to build what was projected to be Europe's largest nuclear power plant. They, were, um, they had four, plant, four reactors up and running in 1986 and they were planning, they were building a couple more and they were planning eventually to have 10 reactors. Um, so I, seeking to, to find out something about the local ecology of this swamp, um, I, I had to go about 200 kilometers away because in the 1960s, the big part of the swamp was dried up. They drained it, put irrigation canals in, in order to make more land available to put this plant in place and also for farming. So, but on the, you know, over in the Belarus side, pretty far, about 200 kilometers away, was this, still this part of the swamp that was still, still swampy, and that's called the Olmani Swamp. And the reason it wasn't dried up in the 60s is because the Soviets turned it into an Air Force bombing range. So I asked a, a local forester if he would give me a tour of the swamp so I could get sort of a baseline of what these ecology is like. And, and so we went off, and you know, there was a lot of spent ordnance sitting around, and um, there was a, a tower that the generals used to you know, watch the flight pass of their pilots, and I climbed to the top of the, the tower. In this swamp area, there had been about 10 villages, um, but those villages had been um, removed when they made it, the bombing range, and so we went to some of the sites of the old villages, and all that was left were cemeteries, and we're looking at an old cemetery. And um, standing there, I, I saw this this bomb crater. There's lots of bomb craters all around because it had been a bombing range. And I saw this pine tree growing out of the, out of the bomb crater and, and I took a close look at the, the pine tree and it looked funny to me. And it had these weird mutations. Now pine needles are <laughs> supposed to all grow straight in the, and, and go in the same direction. That, that's what pine needles want to do. And when they do this, when they curl, <clears throat> that's, biologists say that they're, they get disorganized. And that's a sign of, of a mutation. Now, there are a number of things that can cause um, pines to mutate, but radioactivity is, is, they're very vulnerable to radioactivity. And here this, I looked around, there were other pine trees, no mutations, and there are other craters, but no other pine trees growing out of craters. And so this was the only um, thing is, you know, right in this crater was this pine tree. And, and I took that, um, this photo, and I, and I put it in a file I had because I had seen in the archives um, some references that people had made to testing of, of small strategic nuclear weapons in this bombing range in the 1960s. And I, I couldn't verify that because the record of, of nuclear testing is, is in an archive that's closed to me in Moscow. And that's the nature of power. If you know, people in power want to cordon off knowledge, they can should they deem that to be a classified record. Um, but I thought, you know what, there's gotta be another way to verify this. And I kept looking and I found that other things that led me to believe that there might be something to this nu testing of nuclear weapons in that swamp. This map comes out of a 1974 publication um, in the Soviet Union. And in the translation from Russian is, um, the, of the book was called The uh, Global Fallout of Cesium. Uh, 137 of radioactive cesium. And it turns out that for four years in the 1960s, a team of, of Russian scientists who were specialists in nuclear emergencies, and these are the kind of guys that if they showed up at your back door, you would probably want to just go out the front door and keep on walking. Because they showed up everywhere there was a nuclear emergency in the Soviet Union. And there were a number of nuclear emergencies, secret ones in the Soviet Union. So they were like the grim reapers of nuclear accidents. And so they show up in the swamp, 1962 to 1965, and did this study. And they produced this map that strangely looks a lot like this map, this later Chernobyl map. But this map was produced before they'd even broken ground to the Chernobyl plant. I found that really fascinating. What they found is that that black spot is where it's most radioactive. The red spots are also levels of radioactivity. And they found radioactivity in the soils, in the water, in the flora and fauna of the swamp, and in the bodies of the people who lived in the swamp. They found that 
people living in the swamp had 10 to 30 times more radioactivity in their bodies than people who lived in Minsk and in Kiev. So that's pretty interesting. Um, what I was realizing, I couldn't really solve this problem if, if they were testing nuclear weapons, but looking at that crooked tree, I was reminded of the persistence of, of radioact radioactive contaminants in this part of the world. And I started to think that maybe, you know, that this swamp, maybe they chose it for the Chernobyl plant because it was already radioactive, that it was already a sacrifice zone. And I started to think, you know, this swamp was radioactive before the Chernobyl accident. And so maybe we shouldn't think of Chernobyl as a one-off accident with the beginning, a middle, and the end. Because clearly this accident began before Chernobyl. And maybe we should adopt the term of the environmental historian John McNeil and call Chernobyl an acceleration rather than an accident. And I think the reason that is important is because if Chernobyl is an accident, then it's a discrete event that begins and ends. But seeing Chernobyl as part of a, as a point of acceleration on a timeline of destruction, of, of spreads of radioactive contamination, I began to visualize a much larger succession of events that are ongoing and in flux, a set of occurrences that shape the present and the future as I try to write about them. And, and in many ways, that makes it a difficult job of trying to write about Chernobyl um, and of figuring out the time and the scale of it. And, and Chernobyl makes for a especially slippery historical subject, especially because of these problems of time and scale. Let, let's take time, for instance. Physicists have been saying for over 100 years, for almost 100 years, that the time as we measure it out in seconds and hours and years is a human construct, that actually time expands and contracts in unpredictable ways. Um, Chernobyl brings that insight into sharp focus. People who were exposed to Chernobyl radioactivity experienced a rapid Chernobyl, or radioactive radiation aging is called. So like a 25 year old has the organs and the and, you know, sort of functioning, um, biological functioning of somebody who's in their 60s. Um, so for these people, time sped up. Now, the place in the Chernobyl zone where it, that took the hardest hit of, of radioactivity is called the Red Forest. And there, um, after the cloud passed over, the pine trees turned red, and they died. And then foresters came in and they cut these pine trees down. Uh, and so here's this photograph was taken 25 years after that. Those trees should have long turned to dust, but they didn't. There weren't the microbes, the beetles, the insects to do the job of decomposition. Um, and so that's kind of strange. If Rip Van Winkle had fallen asleep in the Red Forest and woken up 25 years later, he wouldn't have known how much time had passed. For an historian to find a place where time sort of halts, it, it's kind of like your fantasy, you know, as an historian, like freeze frame the past. But then when it actually happens, I was filled with dread to, to, to come to this realization. And what about scale? Now you spill a thousand curies, like that happened in Brazil in 1987, and the International Atomic Energy Agency ranks a thousand curie spill, a level five nuclear emergency. You spill 900,000 times more radioactivity in the Chernobyl accident, and the same agency ranks at a level seven emergency. Now what does that mean? What's the difference between a five and a seven? Um, the Chernobyl records show that people quickly lost track of how to account for the volume of destructive energy let loose from the plant after the accident. And I think we see this today as scientists try to deal with the planetary scope of climate change, that the scaling up of catastrophe to these vast extents is paralyzing to, for human society. We, we, we can't deal with it. Um, so th these problems of time and scale led me to, to continue to search for ways other than text to, and numbers to try to understand Chernobyl as a political, economic, as well as an environmental event. So 
I called up two biologists who um, have been working, and the only, these are the only two scientists I I've, I've, could find who've been consistently working in the Chernobyl zone for over two decades now, and, and that's um, Tim Mousseau and Anders Moller. Um, and I, I asked them if I could follow them as, like, as a participant observer, and, and I did that while I was, was researching. They go two times a year in, in, in June and September, um, and I learned a lot from following them on their trips into the zone. Now, often you hear in the, you know, the stories, if you follow this, that nature in the Chernobyl zone is thriving. Um, and um, that's a story that is puzzles, very puzzling if you've spent any time in the <laughs> Chernobyl zone. You know, editors and journalists often zoom in, and, and scientists zoom in to get this story and zoom out. Now, if you're like this BBC reporter and you can't get that picture that your editor wants of, of thriving nature in the Chernobyl zone, don't worry, they've got some cage animals, you can get the picture. Um, but what, let me assure you that it, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not like that. Nature is not thriving in the Chernobyl zone. As much as we would like to, to under, that's a beautiful story, right? You just walk, humans walk away from nature and it restores itself. Um, what I found following the biologists is that there was no singular zone of radioactivity, that um, levels of radioactivity differ by four orders of magnitude inside the Chernobyl zone. Um, they taught me about the interconnections of the ecosystem. Um, they documented, for instance, a decline in pollinators, bees and butterflies, that led to a loss of frugivores, that's fruit-eating birds for the most part. With less fruit and fewer birds, seeds didn't spread. So they counted all of three new fruit trees planted in the hottest areas since after 1986, seeded in after 1986. So what they're recording is basically a, a cascade of extinction. Um, every rock we turn over, Musso said, we find damage. Now in 2017, I was you know, following them as I, as I was doing in there, and one of the biologists said, well, we're gonna go to the red forest today. And I was like, I had hoped to not have to go to the Red Forest uh, because the levels of radioactivity there are quite high. I, I, um, and, it, you know, and it's not a very pretty forest. Um, you know, we went there and you see these trees with really wild mutations like this one. You know, these pine trees were planted commercially to grow board straight so they could make good lumber for our houses. And you can see this one, this tree didn't get that message. Um, these trees are trying to be pine trees, but they can only manage to be bushes. And you see there, you know, not much of ground. You know, this should be a lush forested ground cover, and you see there this sort of burned out um, thing. But what most disturbed me while we were there um, was my Geiger counter, which was screeching crazily. I, I had expected about 50 microsieverts an hour. That, that's already pretty high. That's uncomfortably high for me. But here my Geiger counter was almost at 1,000 microsieverts, almost a milli. Um, so I, I turned to Tim, one of the biologists, and I said, what's going on? He goes, oh yeah, yeah. Um, we had a fire last fall here. It was a forest fire that went through here, and um, it took all the radioactivity that was stored in the leaf litter and in the branches, and it re-volatized it. Now I checked the press. Uh, there was no coverage of this release of Resuspension of, of radioactivity. This would have been, the IA would have ranked it about a level five emergency. But I think that's part of the problem we have with these long lasting contaminants is that the human attention spans are too short for the 25,000, 24,000 half life of something like plutonium. Um, so if the crooked tree in the swamp shows how radiation predated Chernobyl in the Pripyat marshes. The Red Forest shows how radiation events continued long after. Um, and this ongoing quality really plagued Soviet leaders in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s. As much as they tried, they could not close the chapter on Chernobyl. Um, in 1990, admitting that the biological load was too much, Leaders in Ukraine and Belarus resolved to move 200,000 more people, especially from that second Chernobyl zone around, the, you know, in the Mogilev in southern Belarus. Um, 
But before these new round of evacuations got underway, the Soviet Union fell apart, and there was no longer any money or any political will to move people. And at that point, the UN agencies came in and started um, sort of managing the Chernobyl disaster and making the sort of assessments about what was going on there. Um, first, the World Health Organization was invited in to have an independent ex assessment by experts. They sent in three physicists, and in 10 days, they said, there's no problem here. You could double or triple the doses. That was the World Health Organization in 1989. No one believed them. What can three scientists do in 10 days? So then the Soviets asked, the Moscow leaders asked the International Atomic Energy Agency to come in, and they came in and did a longer study for 18 months. 200 scientists came in, made on these quick, short trips, and they said the same thing. We see no health problems. You could double or triple the dose. And you certainly don't need to move these 200,000 people. They can stay where they are. Um, and they, how could they make those statements? They were you know, sort of basing it off of the Chernobyl, uh, the Hiroshima studies that the Americans had uh, financed since 1950. Um, and they said, you know, if you look at Chernobyl and you look at Hiroshima, the doses at Hiroshima were so much higher, these doses in Chernobyl um, should be fine. But what they didn't take into account was that, you know, Hiroshima was like, was counted as like one big x-ray. The, the doses were um, calculated as, as doses that persisted for less than a second. Chernobyl is a very different nuclear event. People um, got not one high, one big x-ray, one high dose, but chronic low doses over time. It wasn't one external dose, like, a, like an x-ray. It was doses that they were taking through mostly ingesting radioactivity in their food and in, the, in dust particles in the air. So they had radioactivity in their bodies. Um, so what a lot of scientists had said since Chernobyl occurred is what we need is we don't know anything about chronic low doses of radioactivity. We need to take Chernobyl unfortunate accident and, and, and use it as an opportunity and do a long-term epidemiological health study on a large scale like the Hiroshima studies and then we'll know. And scientists were calling from, from 1986 to this present day. Scientists have been calling for that study. And that's the one thing that did not happen in large part because it, the the UN consultant said, there's no need either to move those 200,000 people and there's no need to do a study, you're not gonna find anything. So we don't have that study, we don't really know at this point. Meanwhile, the economic crisis deepened in Ukraine and Belarus and um, people who had received subsidies and medical monitoring, those services went away and in the new neoliberal orientation, in the post-Soviet Union, people were basically abandoned to their own fates on uh, contaminated ground. And, and I think we see this globally in, in many ways. As more and more people live in environments saturated with toxins, risk has been privatized. The constriction of the social welfare state and the planet in a state of ecological crisis is a correlation. Whether there is a causation between those two factors is something I think we should not leave to scientists alone to decide. I think humanists should get involved in that debate. Um, so as commentators in the West announced the end of history in the 1990s, the people in the Chernobyl contaminated ground were left to carry on alone. And, and they ate what they produced, having few other options. And there were few doctors to monitor their health to see what effects there were, if any. Um, in one of the few studies of Chernobyl birth defects, Vladimir Vitorlecki at the University of South Alabama found six times more neural tube birth defects. That's an anencephaly, babies born without brains, and spina bifida. Um, among these people who lived about 200 you know, kilometers from the Chernobyl zone, um, six times higher than the European norm. He also found cesium, radioactive cesium, in the bodies of the mothers and the parents. Now this jump in birth defects could be from Chernobyl radio, radioactive contaminants. It could be from Chernobyl contaminants and nitrates that were put, you know, spread liberally around after the accident to try to soak up, um, to, to fertilize the soils. It could be from Chernobyl radioactivity and pre-Chernobyl radioactivity that was already existing in that swamp. Um, 
my tour through the Pripyat marshes shows that these areas that these scientists are, are working in and studying, their, their living laboratories, are charred with the remnants pitted with deposits of spent ammunition, heavy metals, chemical toxins, and radioactive waste distributed at a frenetic pace in the 20th century. And, and I think that's part of the problem why we don't have many studies, is that the, the scientists sort of throw up their hands and, and can't deal with the complexities of these layered, toxic layers on the landscape. Um, so you might respond to this information by, by feeling empathy for the people out there who live in Ukraine, um, a discreet part of the world over there. And that's how I was trained to think of history, as something that plays out largely inside national borders. Except now we have an awareness of the planetary scale of human actions, a cognizance that diminishes the importance of, of national boundaries. Those events out there make it home. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, as I worked, I, I traveled a lot through northern Ukraine and southern Belarus, and, and one summer, I think it was 2016, I noticed there was just hundreds of berry pickers going through the forest. This is about 150 kilometers from the Chernobyl site. Um, and they, mostly women and children would pick berries and then they would be met on the roads, the forested roads, by these buyers who had vans and they would buy these berries right from the pickers as they came out of the forest. And um, I asked the pickers and they said, well, we buy about, each individually buy about two tons a day. So my research assistant and I, we decided to go undercover berry picking. <clears throat> and here I am selling, happily selling my berries to the buyer on the road. And then we followed the, the, the buyers to the warehouse where, the, where, where they're you know, reselling these berries. And, and there was this nice lady at the warehouse who was buying berries. But before she bought the berries, she measured them for radioactivity. And I said, you know, how many of these berries are radioactive? And she said, all the berries are radioactive, but some are really radioactive. I said, how radioactive? She goes, like 3,000. She didn't know the measurement, but it was 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so we, we stood around, and, and she bought our berries, and, and our berries were under the permissible limit, which is 450 becquerels a kilogram. But I noticed that she, you know, the, she bought all the berries. The, the dirtier berries went over here, and the cleaner berries went over there. And um, I said, why are you buying the dirty berries? You can't use them. They're above the permissible levels. Well, it was just like the sausage. You just mix the clean ones and the dirty ones. I mean, cleaner. They're all radioactive. Cleaner and the dirtier, and you get to the average. Now, after 2014, Ukraine joined the European Union Association, and they have the right to sell their agricultural produce to Poland. And that's what caused this big uptick in industrial scale picking of wild organic berries in the Pripyat marshes, was to sell them to Poland where they enter the EU markets. Now you're probably thinking, oh shoot, when I had my vacation in Europe last summer, I ate really delicious wild organic berries. <laughs> but don't worry, for those of you who didn't have your European vacation last summer, well, I was you know, checking through the Homeland Security records and I found that there was this report about a truck crossing from Canada into the United States and inside the truck was a radiating mass. And the border security guards looked in the truck and no problem, just berries from Ukraine. And I, so I called up the guy who wrote the report. And I said, well, what did you do with those berries? He goes, well, it was within the permissible limits. The permissible limits for the United States is 1,250 becquerels a kilogram. So we let them go in. So now those berries are a little closer to your breakfast plates. Um, and I, I think that that's something that we, we need to take into consideration. Now, I mean, don't, I'm not trying to get you alarmed if you ask a specialist in health physics or radiation medicine, they'll tell you that those, that not to worry, that since the period of global testing, all humans have radioactivity in their bodies. Um, and I think this point underlines what I found, that the Chernobyl accident serves as only an exclamation point in a chain of toxic exposures that have remastered landscapes, societies, politics, and bodies, our bodies. Describing Chernobyl as an accident is a broom to sweep away this larger story around the Chernobyl accident, which is more important. 
I think um, one reason, as I said, there's so little research on Chernobyl is, is the complexity. Um, and the other reason, I think, for the paucity of research on Chernobyl health effects is that I found working through five UN agency archives is that UN agents were colluding with Moscow leaders to make this Chernobyl public health story go away. And I was like, what? And, and I found them, like, they had biopsies of kids with cancers, and they took them back to the University of New Mexico, checked them out. Yes, they were really were cancers. And what did that scientist do? He forgot about that evidence. And in his report, he said there were just anecdotal rumors of, of pediatric thyroid cancer. Um, I found, you know, they took all this, uh, you know, really good material that the Belarusian scientists had gathered, case control studies, and they looked at it and they go, oh, this is just Soviet hogwash. These Soviets, they have bad politics, bad economics, bad science, and tossed it out. Now, why would they do that? Why does the UN, you know, what, what pony did they have in that race? Um, what I found, uh, looking at the politics of the UN, is that the UN serves their client states, and their biggest clients are the big nuclear powers, the US, France, Great Britain, and Russia. These countries were in the 1990s on the line for billions of dollars in liability as the record of the production and testing of nuclear weapons was declassified from archives at the end of the Cold War. The Americans were the biggest transgressors. Um, the Americans had blown up bombs in the Marshall Islands and blown up bombs, most countries blew up bombs in their colonial peripheries. The Americans did that in the Marshall Islands, but they also blew up bombs right in the continental United States, in Nevada. And um, you hear a lot about Nevada and Utah and Idaho downwinders, but if you look at the, um, the, the maps that were reconstructed in the 1990s of Nevada fallout, um, there were hot spots in Minnesota and Rochester and Tennessee that were as hot as at ground zero in Nevada. That, those, that bomb fallout went sky high and it traveled really quickly with the trade winds and came down with the precipitation, mostly in the agricultural Midwest. Um, let's look at, let's compare curies of one isotope alone, radioactive iodine, which is a really pernicious iodine, a radioactive isotope that goes to human thyroids, cause thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, and a host of other endocrine problems. Um, Chernobyl emitted 45 million curies of radioactive iodine. Just testing from the Soviets and the Americans alone in the 1960s, before the Test Ban Treaty in 1963, 20 billion curies. Again, that scale is so big, we have trouble imagining it. Um, but um, the global fallout from nuclear testing mostly spread in the northern hemisphere. Um, and in the same decades, what we see are some really troubling health statistics, again, in the northern hemisphere since the 1951. We've seen cancer rates climb steadily. Um, thyroid cancer is still growing. Um, cancer rates for children, cancer and children in the 1930s used to be a medical rarity. R scientists would come running to see a kid with leukemia because it was so rare. Now, bald kids um, undergoing or advertising chemotherapies on the buses that I ride in Boston and DC. Um, cancers among people born after 1952 are still on the rise. Uh, here's an interesting statistic. Again, only in the Northern Hemisphere, we find that male sperm counts since 1945 have dropped in half. Um, now, these diminished human health indicators have become a background against which Chernobyl statistics were measured. We have what scientists call a shifting background syndrome. Um, in other words, the scale of possible damage from global testing that released at least 20 billion curies of radioactive iodine is too oversized for us to even see. It's a huge fact saturating our daily existence. So I, I just want you to take one last look at, at this, this girl here with blue lips from eating berries as she picks. And I hope you see how she is also a, a nuclear waste worker like these soldiers. Um, that she's there to make a, a living off the toxic detritus left behind in territory that was abandoned by others. But maybe there's also another way to think about this. Um, 
those berries, and later they go back to get cranberries in August and mushrooms in the fall. They're doing the work of what an army of Soviet uh, cleanup workers could not do, and, and tons of chemicals couldn't do. They're taking up from the soils radioactive contaminants. They do it really efficiently and really well. So what if we, rather than deny that these problems exist, rather than forget that this, this radioactivity still is in those soils and is circulating the globe in food products, why don't we just look at it with our eyes wide open? And, and once we do that, we can start to come up with solutions. For instance, we could think of paying her that $25 that she makes a day picking blueberries, and then take the blueberries and deposit them in a radioactive waste dump that's lined and protected, and, and let those berries decay for the 320 years they need to get rid of the strontium and cesium that's in it. And the, the tourists that love to go to the Chernobyl zone I'd pay a lot of money to go to Chernobyl Zone. They would probably pay to pick radioactive berries and take a selfie with a radioactive <laughs> berry. And then they could deposit them in a radioactive waste dump. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, just taking, without denials, just taking a look at this problem with our eyes wide open, I think we can start to picture a brave new world. Thank you. Cardiac. Mm -hmm. But here the pills uh, seem to be largely through oral exposure. So you look, obviously you're going to get thyroid cancer, but are, when, when people die of there, are they doing autopsies? Are they doing what's going on in the stomach, liver, lung, and everything down there that's getting higher and higher up? Yeah, they were doing autopsies in the 80s, and, and those are many of the records I found. And, and, you know, what they would find is, you know, organs with, you know, uh, about 12 different radioactive isotopes in them, depending on what the organ was and the function, you know, the minerals. Um, the radioactive isotopes mimic minerals that the body needs to function. And so if it's something like um, radioactive cesium, it goes to the flesh. Uh, radioactive, you know, plutonium or strontium goes to bone marrow. Um, others, other um, dusts and particles lodge in the um, lungs. Lots goes into through the digestive tract. Um, so yeah, they were finding, as they say, about 12 different. So th those autopsies were that was part of the information that was forwarded on to the UN. Uh, this one KGB general, um, he had a, a clinic, and he goes, my clinic is, you know, he had top secret classification. So he was one of the rare Soviet doctors who could see how get, get to know how much radioactivity the, the patients had been exposed to and he also had all the latest state-of-the-art equipment. He wrote a letter to the Communist Party leadership in 1990 saying, you know, you need to ex extend the zone of, of alienation 120 kilometers from 30 to 120. That would have eclipsed Kiev where he was living. He goes, this stuff is so, you know, like what I'm seeing in my clinic is that people who were functionally healthy become um, sort of invalids in no time with this kind of radioactivity in their bodies. Thank you, very nice, very nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Yeah, you know, we often are faced with this. So the question is, you know, what, now that we're facing this climate change problem, you know, what do we do between the small risk of a big blow up like this and, the, you know, the certain risk of climate change? Um, and I think what we're often um, presented with is this choice between carbon and nuclear. And I think that's kind of a false choice, right? There's a lot, there's a whole rainbow of alternative <laughs> energy options. and. And certainly we can have nuclear in the mix, and, and the nuclear power plants that are going now probably should, as long as they're, they're safe. And we have a big problem with aging nuclear power plants along our coasts with rising water 
you know, so we have to think about that. Um, but if, you're, if we're going to solve this climate problem, we need to solve it today or this week or this month. And so we could put solar panels on this roof within a week. If we wanted to build a nuclear power plant in the, in the parking lot, that would take, it'd take about five, 10 years to get you guys to agree to it, if that ever happened. <laughs> and then it'd take another 15 years to build it. And so just in terms of timing, nuclear, we would need 12,000 to replace fossil fuels. We need 12,000 new nuclear power plants on the globe. We have 400 today. That's a big scale up. And we just don't have the time. On top of that, um, most uh, nations are deciding that these, building these new nuclear power plants is too expensive. It's about 50% higher in terms of, of you know, cost, in terms of the, the electricity produced than, than the renewables. So you know, solar and wind is, are great options. They're affordable. Um, they, can, they need to be plugged in depending on, you know, it's not one, a one-size-fits-all modernist solution. I mean, what we want is like the the Costco solution, you know, everybody gets the same thing. But what we need to do is think about local climates, local environments, and, and that's a little bit more complicated, but a, a far more efficient. Um, and then, yeah, nuclear, there's this sort of bridge. What happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow or the tides aren't working? Then um, nuclear could be a great bridge. The, the, the nuclear engineers at MIT think like for about five to 10% of the power as a, as a bridge. Um, so it could be part of this portfolio, but we, we do need to think more creatively and think outside of this false choice between fossil fuels and nuclear. We're being sold that false choice, I don't know why. And I, I, well, actually, I, I think I do know why, because as long as uh, a corporation can, can meter it, you know, dispersed, economically dispersed sources of energy where you can have, an, you know, solar panels and, and the farmers can have the wind turbines spreads out the profits for making, producing that energy, and corporations don't want to share the profits. But I think we should think about what it means to democratize energy. Would that help in democratizing other features of our economic and political systems? I, I have a feeling it would go a long way. Yeah, it's quite clear. You can see 1986 right there. It's really pretty amazing. Yeah, the, the biologists I worked with did that. And do you know what the results were? Um, what do you mean, like? Well, I mean, like, what, you know, you could see, you know, what's the radioactivity diminished to the situation among the trees, or did it increase because they're taking up the radioactivity? Yeah, that's what's happening, is they're taking it up as they, as they grow. They grow more slowly. Um, with radioactivity. These are birch, so they, no, these are pine. Um, but yeah, they've been working a fair amount with, with how that is. One, one set of sampling I wish I had done, and I only thought of it later after I finished publishing this book and worked with microbiologists, um, is I wish I'd done a core sample of some of the outhouses in the abandoned territories. And then you could see, you know, whether there was much mutations in the microbial of the feces of the humans, and I, and I think that would be sort of a good biomarker. So if anybody wants to go do that, please. <laughs> so on, on that note, um, I propose <laughs> that, that, we, that we eat some food. Uh, and there's food and drinks um, out in the lobby for reception. Uh, and please, let's thank Dr. Brown again.